Hello, everyone. On behalf of the Community Design Center of Rochester Board of Directors and staff, I'd like to welcome you to the 16th annual Reshaping Rochester Lecture Series. My name is Maria Ferguelli, and I am the Executive Director of the Community Design Center of Rochester. And this year's theme is Building a Just Community. In 2015, the theme for the lecture series was Balancing the Scales, Equity by Design. This is where we first began to explore the intersection between placemaking and equity. We believe that the theme of this year's lecture series, Building a Just Community, can be a catalyst for much needed conversations and an inspiring action that can have a positive impact in our community. All of our programs for 2021 uh, will support this theme. Before we go too far, I'd like to let you know that closed captioning is available. So please um, see the instructions in the chat box or go to the bar below where you can activate uh, subtitles. Before we go too far, I'd like to share a little bit of information about the Community Design Center. Uh, the Design Center was founded in 2003 and is celebrating nearly two decades of service to the greater Rochester region. We promote design excellence and sustainability of the built environment through advocacy, education, and grassroots community facilitation. Let me introduce you to our board of directors. On the top row is our executive team, Bill Price, board president, Monica McCullough, vice president, Stephanie Nunziata, our treasurer, and Vanessa Villeneuve, our secretary. And our other board members are Natalie Anderson, Eugenio Marlin, Howard Decker, and Tanya Zweilen. Thank you so much for your commitment, your guidance, and your support. We'd like to take this time to recognize and thank the New York State Council of the Arts who have made our work possible through their generous support for many, many years. And I'd like to uh, thank our circle of friends. Our circle of friends members are persons or businesses that have made a commitment of sustained support to our organization. We gratefully acknowledge their support and extend an invitation to any of you who value the work of the Design Center, we invite you to join our circle. A special thank you to our presenting sponsor, Home Leasing. We are truly grateful for Home Leasing's commitment to the series and again, their continued and generous support. We are also grateful to the ESL Charitable Foundation for their generous and continued support of the series and also to the Community Preservation Corporation for their support as well. We are very grateful to have Reconnect Rochester as our event sponsor today, and uh, they have a great team supporting their work and we often collaborate together. So special thanks to Reconnect Rochester. And our bronze sponsors, the Greater Rochester Association of Realtors and Hevron and Company. Thanks to our exclusive media sponsor, WXXI, and to the AIA Rochester for being our sponsor for our professional development credits. We are grateful to all of our supporting sponsors and lecture series friends. Thank you so much again for your support. I'd like to take this opportunity to recognize the unsung heroes that have made this series possible. CDCR staff, Monica Reifenstein in particular for being our Zoom wizard behind the scenes our lecture planning committee that years, works years round to plan this series, and of course, to our board of directors. And this is just a reminder to please take the survey at the end of your presentation. Your feedback is helpful in helping us plan our future programming. The following slides are for those individuals who would like to get professional development credits. This presentation is approved for APA and AICP professional development credits, as well as AIA credits. If you wish to receive credit for this presentation, uh, please note that Monica uh, will post in the chat uh, how to register. Please take a note of the brief uh, course description. And these are our learning objectives for today's program. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Nidhi Gulati was one of Project for Public Spaces Directors of Programs and Projects 
and a member of the executive leadership team. Needy is a trained architect and urban researcher who first joined Projects for Public Spaces in 2013 as a transportation associate. In that role, she worked on more than 20 projects across the US and abroad and delivered her first keynote speech at the second International Forum on Public Spaces in Bogota, Colombia in 2014. Needy received her bachelor's degree in architecture from Malavilla National Institute of Technology in Jaipur. She graduated from Texas A&M University in 2012 with a master's degree in recreation, park and tourism sciences. She joins us today from Fontainebleau, France, where she is currently completing her MBA in NCED. She is born and raised, she was born and raised Indian with a tremendous appreciation for trains, a love for walking as a mode of transportation, a drive to inform the ongoing urban explosion in developing economies, and a deep sensitivity towards the issues of gender, race, and their manifestation in the built environment. Ingrained in all of her work is the commitment to better serve the most vulnerable populations in our cities and towns, including women and children. Hello, Needy, and now I invite you to share your screen. We're looking forward to a wonderful presentation. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, let me do the sharing of the screen dance again. And here we go. Desktop two, share. You see my beautiful image of Amsterdam. We do. Excellent. And now do you see my slide? We do. Excellent. All right, let's get started. Um, first of all, uh, let me take a moment to thank Maria and Monica from CDC Rochester for this very generous uh, invitation. And to all of you for being here today. I'm glad to be joining you in these just ongoing, unusual times and to talk about something that brings me joy. I'm also excited to join you from France and the INSEAD campus in Fontainebleau. So I'm actually um, on campus where I'm pursuing a, um, an MBA. So I'm back to being a student. My name is Nithi Gulati, as Maria said, I'm a social impact executive and just all in all a city nerd. I was previously the co-executive director and head of programs at Project for Public Spaces and PPS, so for those of you who may not know, is a, is a planning and design nonprofit uh, based in New York City. We were founded in 1975 with a mission to transform how public spaces are designed and maintained over time. And that entire work, that entire portfolio revolved around a community-based uh, and human-centered approach to public spaces that shifts the power of public space design from like technical experts to members of the community who we believe are the true experts of their own lives. We also have a strong focus on streets and transportation. We always have had because our streets hold the single largest chunk of our public spaces in almost all cities around the world. Um, and they also account for our single largest kind of ticket item in most municipal budgets when it comes to our built environment. So as an organization that's focused on public spaces, streets just become our largest playground and they continue to be my, my largest playground. So this presentation is split into kind of the following sections. You know, we will begin uh, with acknowledging our current state of mind. And then I'll share a bit about my story and how I got to the work I do, followed by why should we care about mobility and transportation? After which I'll talk a little bit about a proposed methodology to think about public spaces and mobility. And we'll talk about a few actions that, um, that you all in your community can start to take. So let's begin with what's top of mind today. I want you all to just take a second to go to menti.com and please use the code that's at top of the, the slide there um, and write in, in there, what is top of mind today? It can be a word, a sentence, whatever you feel like. Just please tell me what is top of mind today so we can weave in some of those thoughts with the rest of the presentation. So let's take two. In the meantime, enjoy Amsterdam for those of you who are still looking at the screen. All right. Mm -hmm. 
Maria, can you see my screen now? Is it just Amsterdam still or can you see my presentation? No, we can see your presentation in the scrolling comments. Excellent. Excellent. Fantastic. Let me know if you at any point the screen stops advancing and we'll make sure that that doesn't happen. Planning our trip to Colombia, beautiful. Vaccines, yes. Yes. Trains, always. I love, love trains. <sighs> yes, the news. Not always the things we want to see, the things we are left to deal with. Thank you so much for sharing with me today and with all of us and with each other. I really appreciate your vulnerability and presence in the moment. So I'll tell you what's top of mind for me. Um, Boston Mayor Kim Jenny. Um, Boston is a city of my chosen family and it means a lot to me to see a woman, a woman of color in this incredibly important position. So that's top of mind for me today. And hopefully that theme will continue to weave in to what we are gonna, going to talk about. I will also share a transcript version of the answers that you all submitted to CDC and hopefully you'll get to see this later on as well of what what was top of mind when we did this presentation. So, you know, I, I was asked to share a little bit about my story and how I got to doing the work that I do. And I think it's important to recognize where I come from. So I'm, I'm a born and raised Indian and the streets that I grew up on uh, kind of look like the streets, uh, street that you see on the side there. You know, I, when I was growing up and through my forming years, life happened on our streets. You can see that there's, there's no marking, there's no curb. And oftentimes you can see all possible modes of transportation represented in this street. Cars also utilize this road, mind you, and so do buses and trucks, although the buses and trucks are restricted to certain times of the day and other times you don't see them um, here. I also knew streets as places of commerce, you know, the formal and the informal commerce. And sometimes they were regulated and sometimes they were just completely intuitive and impromptu um, management of those, those spaces. And these were places where you run into other people. There was constantly negotiation of space, negotiation of commerce. You can see that there is kind of two layers of shopping here, the actual established shops, and then there's a whole other layer of the informal shop set up on the sidewalk. This is also where you saw like layering of things, like layering of textures, layering of colors, layering of goods that you were purchasing. And this was where we learned how to live life and what society was like, because you can clearly see there's some sort of gender balance and gender nuance in this photograph. There's some sort of social cues yet that you can um, notice. Some people are looking at each other, their postures, some people, prefer to shop in the more brick and mortar shops and other people prefer to be on the sidewalk shops. So there's all of these things about our society and its diversity that we could actually see in our streets. In the neighborhood that I grew up, I had a very small pocket park for a very small portion of my life where I went. And then that pocket park was redeveloped into a municipal well, like a well for clean, clean water to be distributed in that neighborhood. And we lost that park. So after that, my street was my primary public space. That's where everything in my life after school happened. As far as mobility goes, um, I knew that as a very kind of multifaceted and multimodal system. You know, something that by its very nature supports trip chaining, this idea of like making lots of different small trips and then being connected almost like a chain. And we relied a lot on kind of the human body um, and the machine, you know, there were, there were buses and trains and so forth. So we relied on both of those things. Um, I took a lot of metro trains during my time in Delhi, but mostly, you know, for longer distance travels and for shorter trips, I would do rickshaws and walking and cycling and taking the bus. I also had a motorcycle, um, but I never really used it. It was just one of those things. But I want to say that life wasn't perfect. I'm not trying to paint this kind of overtly rosy photo of what was going on. Not everything about this life was perfect. In fact, it was far from it. Where I lived was not the safest place to be a woman. The built environment often ignored the unique needs and challenges that women and gender minorities face, especially in our public spaces. But that said, I did not need to learn how to drive to be a fully functional and independent adult. 
you know, driving the way I learned, I grew up with was an option. That until I decided to pursue my higher education in Texas in the US. So, you know, I remember diligently researching everything about the university, you know, what the research endowments, departments, mascot, and all of that, um, except that I forgot to research public transportation. In my head, you know, a, a functional and reliable public transit is a must in any functional city or town. You know, after all, I was moving to America and, you know, the country of choice. Um, and that in my mind, choice meant having a variety of modes to travel. And that meant having public transportation. And then I got a new zip code. So I landed in Houston, Texas, and thus began my very deep love and hate relationship with that town. So, you know, I'm new in this country. I'm just getting off the airplane. I don't have a working cell phone. And I have these instructions to catch a shuttle um, on printed on a piece of paper. Like, how do I catch a shuttle to go to college station where my university is an hour and a half outside of Houston? So I get to the shuttle stop um, and, you know, slowly but surely, everybody in the airport disappears, you know, from the arrival lounge to the shuttle gate, everybody's gone. I'm the only person waiting for a shuttle um, in, to the point that I actually went back and double checked with people if I was in the right spot. and. You know, I was the only person waiting for a shuttle, which basically cost me $35, one way ticket. So $35, you can rent cars, car in Texas. And the shuttle is like a large SP, um, which again is not surprising to anybody. And there was only one person in that shuttle. All right, so as I said, so I, I changed the zip code. I ended up in Houston, Texas and made my journey to College Station, Texas. Felt like I was getting trapped um, and it had a very strong hit to my sense of autonomy and my sense of independence. My social life started to disappear and I started questioning everything around me and my built environment and how it was impacting me, but how we could also be impacting so many other people that live in our communities and our societies. So I started peeling these layers of what does the built environment do to you? How did the built environment get to be the way that it is? And who is it impacting and in how, how many ways? So the first thing I started to realize was that, you know, the way that we are now choosing to transport humans, transport ourselves and our goods is having a tremendous impact on our, our planet. It's having a tremendous in, impact on our climate. And we're contributing a lot to these sort of emissions around the world. So this was like my new zip code and me coming to the realization that by moving countries, merely by moving zip codes and flying from one country to another and changing virtually nothing else about my lifestyle, I had quadrupled my own footprint because I was part of the census, I was part of the population, and there was a parking spot waiting for me at the grocery, at the doctor, at school, even if I wasn't the one utilizing it. And then the layers of things that are within it, it's not just about, um, you know, transportation it's itself, it's not just about me driving a car, it's about all the infrastructure that we need that has embedded um, carbon emissions too, the asphalt that we pour, the, the, the fuels that we get out of the ground, the coal that we use and all of that, it has a cumulative effect. And out of these, all these sort of pies, all these circles that we see on top of every country, we also realize that the transportation sector, so the entire sector of movement and people and goods is the single largest contributor of um, greenhouse emissions into the atmosphere. So that the biggest chunk of that circle um, belongs to transportation related emissions. And these emissions, the weight of these emissions doesn't rest equally um, among all the different transportation modes. It's not, it's not equal the way we tend to transport our, our things. So road-based transportation, particularly of people and goods has a much heavier impact uh, per capita, per item um, moved, it has a much heavier impact on, um, on the planet than rail-based ones, than you know, domestic aviation even, and then coastal shipping. The road-based transportation, it is that impact is just outsized um, as compared to some of the other mechanisms by which. So 
Again, I want to reemphasize this is not just about our individual cars, but all the other kind of tools that we need to build that entire ecosystem of transportation via road. All right, do we see Rochester now? Yes. Fantastic. And I see that the visualization is now not working because it's a PDF. So this actually ended up showing the inner loop that was laid on top of Rochester. And in, in some ways, when you see it as, as, a, as a video, as a, as a GIF, it shows that it actually started impacting some of our more vulnerable communities much heavily. And um, we had a fabric, we had a network underneath those, those highways before they started coming, coming online. So the next layer that I started peeling was that not only was road-based transportation hurting our planet, the creation of that road-based transportation system had had a very unequal impact on different communities. It had had a much worse impact on black and brown communities. And we are still reeling from those impacts. We're still waiting for those communities to be connected. There's a bunch more data on it. If, if you're all curious, if you go to OU's Institute for Quality Communities, there's this 60 years of urban change data on there, which kind of has these slider um, animations. You have an old map and you kind of do the slider on top of it and it shows you what our built environment used to look like and what it looks now since we plotted those, those highways. And one of the more kind of the ones that hurts me a bit more is this, this one of, of Providence. And you can see on the left there what you see and then you can see on the right what's coming. And again, large, large, large chunks of our neighborhoods were taken away, our communities were taken away by this mechanism, this new mode of um, moving people and goods. And, and we, can, we can say what we want to say about having connections across freeways and you know, finding other mechanisms to connect communities. But the reality is this particular highway that you see in this map is as big a divider as, as a river might be, as a very sort of strong natural element might be, this divides communities and it divides access and that division is not felt equally by different, different communities. The other layer that I peeled and started to realize was that there were lots of things underneath this suburban sprawling development pattern. Um, and the fact that it was having an impact on people's social, psychological, emotional health, in addition to restricting people's sort of access to downtowns, access to jobs and all of that, people, if they were traveling alone in, in their pods, it was having an impact on their, their psychological health and social health as well. They were spending a very significant amount of their day-to-day -day commute um, alone, whereas if you had the opportunity to walk on a sidewalk, ride a, a cycle with somebody else, or be on public transportation, your, um, your emotional and psychological health would be very, very different. In addition, it feels that, you know, being further apart and sprawling development um, is, you know, maybe not as expensive to maintain, but that's the data doesn't line up. It's equally expensive and not more expensive to maintain that infrastructure because you're stretching your utilities, you're stretching your environment and your facilities over a much, much, much larger area. And people need to be catered to. We need electricity, we need the new grid, we need all other utilities to maintain a kind of a more spread out lifestyle. And it's, it's having all these other kinds of impacts on our life. So as I said, when we decide to spread our, our life and our movement across a wider surface area, um, we're essentially stretching our resources and our public space too thin. And then we simply don't have enough activity or enough retail to line all these streets. The, re the reality looks something like this, where we have much sparser um, development all along our streets and they become kind of just one use, single use, single experience kind of space where you're getting from point A to point B, but street is no longer the destination. It's merely the connector. And then I started peeling another layer, which was probably one of the most hurtful ones to me, me personally, because as I said, I was coming from being an independent adult living in Delhi to, a, in my mind, a much sort of freer society. And I started learning about the, the gender gap in um, transportation. So if you haven't read 
uh, Carolyn Corretto Perez's book, Invisible Women. I urge you to read it. There are some summaries out there. She's done several podcasts and there are other methods by which you can find the information that's in this book. But basically she's, she's a researcher, she's a medical researcher. And she started to research the, the data biases in medical um, data keeping. And then one of the biases she found was women were having more you know, serious injuries out of an automobile crash. Women were more likely to have a serious injury. Women were more likely to die in an automobile crash and not really knowing why until she started peeling layers on her own. And one of the things that she, she discovered was that you know, the design of our automobiles, which have all this sort of sophisticated infrastructure for safety, that design utilizes a male dummy, a male body to design all of its, its safety mechanisms. And then we look at where we are today, where more than 50% of the, the driving population, the driving license holders are actually women. And how much risk we're, we're putting ourselves in by getting behind the wheel of an automobile, that is not even designed for our bodies, that is not even designed to protect us. And then we start applying that to you know, bigger scales and we realize that most of our transportation infrastructure, most of our cities were designed by men. And that means that oftentimes they also work for men. So there's a huge gap in who our cities are designed to serve and therefore they serve only them. The cost of this is tremendous because if, you know, more than 50% of now the workforce, the eligible workforce being women are not even contributing their full self. They're not even um, functioning as their full selves. There's an immense untapped potential there. But then at the same time, we are owed that from our built environment. We're owed that from, from the world. Um, and that data bias and that gender gap needs to be acknowledged as well. So then I say it's our choice. It's our choice whether we want um, to design our built environment around, you know, a thing that we like, a mechanism of moving around, or whether we want to design it for our bodies and the experience that we have as human beings, because we are capable of doing both. We're capable of designing for a smaller scale and a different reality. It comes down to what our choice is, because we will have to scale our city to fit the body that we choose that we're designing for. If we design for a human body, the scale looks different. If we design for the smaller car, it looks scale looks different. And if we design for the bigger car, the scale looks entirely different. So it's then a very intentional choice on our end. And as I said, we knew how to do this. We've always known. This is one of my favorite photographs from um, Lisbon, Portugal. I was I was there a few months ago, and it just reminded me that you know there are all those modes here. There, it's possible to have a city that also. Um, has cars, but it's just not every movement is designed around that. And even obviously that the cars are, are smaller. Or if we want to design for the, the bigger thing, the bigger toy, the bigger um, tool. And if we do that, then maybe we're acknowledging that our built environment would be spread over a bigger distance and the scale will look, will look different. So, you know, I love this quote from, from Jane Jacobs, and I know a lot of people, when they read it, they were appalled, but there's a lot to be said about this statement, um, that automobile was one of the chief destroyers of, of communities, um, and especially true for kind of the, the built environment, the built fabric of our communities. So after peeling all those layers, I was, I was fortunate to discover the thing, you know, that there's something else that I can do. There's another place where I could put a lot of my energies and, and practice differently. And that thing way basically was a different way of thinking about our cities where public input, people's visions is the primary driver of how we create our cities. The livability of our communities, access and connection with human beings, our, our, our neighbors is the primary driver. So it's possible to do that. And we have the opportunity to kind of take away what we've built and transform it something, into something different. And I know that that's happening in your city as well. I know that it's happening all around the country and that brings me a lot of hope. So what do I you know, then propose as a different approach? You know, if, if the designing around the automobile, designing around point A to point B movement is not working, then what can work? Well, one of the things that we can do and is, is relatively simple to kind of wrap our heads around is, 
How about we recenter the human experience and the human body when we're thinking about designing our cities and towns? How about the bigger focus is now the human being? So if that is our primary focus, then we can actually think about creating the other systems that make our neighborhoods and cities work. The system of transportation, the system of, of parks, the system of moving goods, the system of recycling, public transportation, education, and all of that, all of the other utilities, those systems can then be layered on. But the center, the focus that we are um, putting on is, is the human body. And what that could lead to, if we then shrink to that scale of the human body, this I'm, I'm very glad to bring this, this infographic to you from the 15 minute city vision of Paris's mayor, which essentially just does that, that if you center the human life and human experience with that human scale, we can essentially have everything that we need to live a full life, to spend our entire day within 15 minutes of us if we decide that the way that we want to move is through human powered mobility, not just walking, walking, mobility, assistive devices, cycling, sometimes public transportation, sometimes cars, sometimes Ubers, but primarily around human powered mobility. If we wanted to do that, our scale becomes much smaller and it's possible to do that because we had done that for centuries before we started to, to you know, change the way by which we got around. And what role then does a street play? If that is our lens, a street can play lots of different roles. A street can be the public space that it deserves to be. A street can be where we have a linear park and connected parklets. It can be the place again, where we have smaller shops that combined give us the same experience that a big grocery store might, but actually let's decentralize that experience and put it along the street. So our street then becomes this tremendous opportunity where we can actually stay, a street that is a place to be, not just a place to get through. So it prevent, provides us with that tremendous opportunity to rethink our streets. What if we were to live our life on our streets again? What if we were to run into our neighbors on the street again? And what if that was where we shopped, ate, uh, spent our time, recreated, and, and all those other things? So some of these visions are in fact very, very promising. And it's not, it's not something that we don't know. It's not something that we have not recently experienced because heartbreaking COVID-19 experiences for many of us were this realization. I was one of the more fortunate people. I was so privileged at that time to be in a part of New York City where a typical day in 2019, my access to the city looked something like this. So all the red bubbles you see, I had access to that much city. Um, in a typical day in 2019. But when the, when the coronavirus hit, we, to, to preserve our communities and to minimize the spread, we, we went home. We started working from home and my access shrunk to the neighborhood that I was in. I was in Astoria, Queens, again, tremendously privileged and lucky to be in that place because I was able to do everything I wanted within 15 minutes of me. I was able to even switch all my my doctors and shopping habits and needs and everything to my own neighborhood. And the reason I could do that was because my neighborhood looked something like this. So all these little icons that we see, this is just a typical Google Earth capture that kind of shows you that I was fortunate to have access to all the things that I needed within 15 minutes of me, except my workplace, which was in Manhattan, but now that I was working from home, this is what my, my daily experience looked like. And I didn't need to leave Astoria. And again, I had that privilege of doing that. Many of us don't, but how do we, again, then, how do we start to change that? How do we start to create that 15 minute city? Because, because this is not the first pandemic. This is not the last pandemic. We will have more of these. How are we preparing ourselves um, to deal with them better? And how are we preparing ourselves so that there's not only a handful of us who are privileged to live this life, but more and more of us, especially those who can't bear the burden of having five cars in a household, how can we create this experience for, for them? And sure enough, you know, streets responded, cities responded, businesses responded. This was the street right outside um, my, my apartment. And again, we, we opened up and it was a entirely different level and scale of piloting, a different scale of making change. Um, and looking at this photo now, I'm incredibly nostalgic for, for New York and realizing that I'm now many, many, many thousand miles away again. So 
with the idea of the 15 minute city, I want to bring us back to the focus audience because it's important to keep our focus. So the key question then becomes 15 minute city for whom? I will share my personal idea of what I center in my, in my work, in my practice, in my advocacy. And that is a little girl, um, a, a, a girl of color. Um, I am a woman of color, so I definitely you know, relate to that audience and somebody who's maybe an immigrant, maybe a minority in another aspect and somebody who may not always have been centered in our decision making. So that this is my priority audience. And I just wanted to put it, put it out there that what if we designed our 15 minute city for this little girl to thrive. So what kind of what kind of city will then be we create? So we'll have to ask ourselves, what is that experience that we want that little girl to have? What kind of street do we want that little girl to have? And what kind of agency and autonomy do we want this little girl to have? Can she play a role in the design of her own neighborhood? Can we ask her what kind of play experiences she wants? What kinds of um, social experiences she wants? and build a city with that. So the first and most important thing for us is to think about that priority audience and what kind of life do we want that audience to have in their own neighborhood? What, how will this shape their future development? How will this shape her as a human being and center that in our thinking? So priority audience would be, would be step one when we start thinking about this 15 minute city. And then step two would be to start thinking about the ecosystem of stakeholders around that priority audience. So we've had, we found our North Star. So with that North Star, who are the different players in our environment who have a, any level of agency or power or influence over that little girl's experience in her neighborhood? So let's plot that, that ecosystem of stakeholders around her her caregivers, the, the health agencies, her educators, planners and designers, um, you know, civic officials, policymakers, retailers, entrepreneurs, service providers, all of that. Let's map that ecosystem of stakeholders. And with them, this is where I'll bring in the, the placemaking approach uh, from Project for Public Spaces. So having our priority audience defining the stakeholders, the next thing we wanna do is define what place are we looking at? Are we looking at a street? Are we looking at a park? Are we looking at an entire neighborhood? Let's define that place with that, with that audience, with that priority um, beneficiary. And then start to evaluate with them about their neighborhood. What is working? What's not working? What is unique about your community today? What do you envision being unique about your community tomorrow? And then identifying those issues, identifying those opportunities, Let's build a vision around that. So as I said, there are very, there are many ways of, and many tools in our toolbox to think about how do we evaluate our environment with our priority audiences? Let's get creative around, you know, the, the little kid having something to say about their planning meeting, about their future park, because the chances are it's gonna impact their life the most. So let's engage them and collect all of their ideas in as many different ways as we can to understand how they see their own neighborhood evolving and changing over, over the course of five, 10, 15 years. And utilize that. So after evaluating those issues and opportunities, utilizing all that data and synthesizing into a vision. So this particular case you see here, this is the plaza at, at, at Harvard University. This was a kind of a lighter, quicker, cheaper, or tactical activation strategy that Project for Public Spaces did. did. And what you see here is, is a vision map for that, which was essentially just a collection of moments and experiences that people wanted to have plotted on top of a public space. So let's think about what is the kind of experience that people want to have and how can we start to then rally the stakeholders back again around that vision? You know, how do we bring those stakeholders back into the the policymakers, the decision makers, the planners and designers that look, our community has shared all of their thoughts and visions and ideas with us. This is how they see their neighborhood evolving. How can we now make it happen? How can we rally all those players to where, towards that, that vision? And then let's start to pilot some things. You know, we, we again, we saw in 2020, like never before, that we're capable of piloting changes to our city, to our built environment very quickly. So let's start to pilot some of these things out in our public realm and see how they work, see how they're perceived, if they work. And if they don't work, let's think about something different. And 
pilot tests to actually be looked at as pilots as something that we learn from and iterate upon not and not do them just because we have fewer resources so pilots as true pilots as something that we learn from and again thinking about the priority audience and all all their kind of other ecosystem of their caregivers and players players around them um, and start to reclaim some of our transportation infrastructure some of the space that we've given over to certain modes of transportation back in as as public space and mind you this will not only occur at one scale the scale of the place that we looked at this kind of thinking of centering around our priority audience bringing them in to evaluate the issues will need to occur at least at three different levels at the level of the system you know as we talked about the the highway systems and the entire mobility system has been designed with kind of like a getting a to b mindset with all the discriminatory layers um, how do we now change that so we will need to change the system with the priority audience in mind and then we'll need to change you know the middle layer the layer of in this case the street because we're looking at infrastructure but the layer of the planners designers the architects the people who translate the information that's in the system for our everyday experiences let's let's start to transform that middle layer and then also at the same time let's start to think very much at the human scale my street my park level and start to transform that so we will need to take a multi-layered approach to make this happen because streets are the lifeblood of our communities and they're also the foundation of our urban economies at the same time they've now ended up making up for more than 80 percent of all the public space in our cities so public space as the common ground as it deserves to be in our communities it is our responsibility to think about about them differently so how can we start i promise that after the the concept of why transportation? What is a different way of doing things? What is placemaking? Um, where can we begin? We've, we've seen some of these concepts. Where can we begin? Well, we have a tremendous opportunity in Rochester right now. You know, if we're thinking about the idea of this 15 minute city, there are neighborhoods. There are neighborhoods with identity, their own unique identity in Rochester. Now let's start to think about them one by one. Are they functioning currently as a 15 minute city? Could they function as a 15 minute city? which ones should we look at first in order to be much more equitable and to start to actually um, plug the gaps that our highways have created in the past. The other thing that place where we could begin is the, is the placemaking initiative that is um, currently afoot in Rochester. So all these dots, I got this from your city of Rochester placemaking um, strategy map. So all these little dots that we have now, can we go dot by dot and take a human-centered approach to really think about what would make that particular dot unique? How would we make that a sort of focal point, a fulcrum of a 15-minute city? That is another place where we could start. And a third place where we could start is the transit-ready corridors. You know, So if these are the corridors that have been identified, how do we think about each one of those streets as a series of destinations as a string of pearls, if I may. And again, as I said, there are, there are several tools that can allow us to make that happen. One particular one of those tools is this, this process map that you saw that can be adapted to any scale of public, public space. And another is something that I, I was working on right until leaving Project for Public Spaces was a um, initiative around public transportation. So what you see on the right of the screen there, the reimagining key transit stops. That's a free publication available on Project for Public Spaces' site, um, which gives you some ideas of how could we transform, in this case, a transit hub into a hub of activity, a hub of, for community, um, and one that allows us to achieve many of our day-to-day -day functions in and around our public transportation. So there's some creative ideas here that we can look at and this is another one that goes even further from the hub level to the stop level. How can we reimagine our bus stop as a fulcrum of activity, as a fulcrum of destinations where people can have a variety of experiences and do many, many of their daily tasks in addition to potentially taking the bus? Because again, it is about that intentionality. It is about finding our focal beneficiary group, our focus, aud focus audience that we can start to reimagine the experience. And then it's our choice. Do we want to spread it out thin or do we want to actually create an environment where humans can power their own ability, can power their own experience and make much 
stronger experiences that give the agency back to the human. And all of this is possible. We've done it. We're doing it around the world. There are so many ways in which public spaces have served the communities that they're in and can continue to do so. It's about us taking those efforts intentionally. I will play this video. Hopefully it will let me play. I'm going to pause sharing just for a second. Thank you everyone for hanging in there with us through our technical glitches. Um, Needy, great, great recovery. Thank you for your efforts. I know it's a, we were speaking before we got into our, our presentation about these issues that come up and all the craziness that happens behind the scenes. So really appreciate you uh, hanging in there and offering uh, your advice and insights. Um, so this video is definitely worth the wait. So Needy, let me know when you're ready. Needy, uh, I love the statement that you made. Uh, I think the foundational statement that you made saying it's up to us to design streets that work for every person, every activity and every occasion. Streets are places. And it's amazing how much thinking about streets as places can change the way we will uh, may choose to use those spaces, the way we may choose to prioritize decision making around those places. Um, and so I think your, your presentation really illustrated, it illustrated that. Um, we have always been trying to share this message about the need to center space around the human person, you know, human scale and human experience. I, I love that. Are you, are you ready to share your video? I'm ready to share my video. Um, I also think it works perfectly with the statement that you were just making, because the video that I'm going to show you is all about who is the focus, what is the experience that we're trying to have, and how can we then align our disciplines, align our infrastructure to facilitate that experience. So let's give this one more try, because I have it queued up now. And I'm going to optimize for video clip, share. Can you see my screen? Yes. There we go.
thank you so much for that. That that video really is a great way to capture uh, all that our streets can be and how they can contribute to our communities and uh, more, you know, particularly to human experience. With that, um, there are a few things that I wanted to kind of talk about to get us started. One has to do with um, this whole idea in, in the process that you described for us, this whole idea of the need to create opportunities for testing things. You know, in our profession, we, we, we call it tactical urbanism, what you were talking about. Um, you, you said it was uh, a way to, to do, you know, some, some trials and, and uh, pilots. Uh, and I think that's something that's kind of missing in our process. We, at the Community Design Center, we really uh, talk, talk about and try to advocate for that community engagement, what we call authentic community engagement, which is exactly what you described, identifying that target audience and engaging them in, in helping them, uh, in one sense, gain an understanding of the design language, of the strategies and principles that are commonly used tools, but then also to help them learn to use these tools to express themselves and to create, uh, co-create their own space. Um, but then that testing part seems, uh, we've applied it in some places, but not, not consistently. And the value, I kind of want you to speak a little bit to the value of, of having that test and understanding that that test in order for it to be effective, does not necessarily go by all the rules, right? Sometimes we're testing something that is not typically allowed, that is beyond the, the normal experience and the need to create a mechanism to allow for that to happen so that we can inform decision-making. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about that? Right, um, I wanted to touch on a few things that you just mentioned, Maria, about this, this idea of authentic community engagement. I feel like our, our community engagement processes have also become kind of very by the book. Like there's the, the fact that there's always a booklet for how to engage community uh, and how to make that happen. It's also a little disturbing to me because if we're actually trying to understand who our community is and who these people are, we should also think about how do they want to be engaged? How do people like expressing themselves? Are they comfortable standing up in a meeting of a hundred people and and telling somebody this is what they want? Or would they rather share with you in a one-on-one -on -one interview over a phone? Or would they rather just write up a story and share with you? Or would they rather just put a dot on a series of choices and tell you what they prefer? So we first have to think about how the people we're trying to engage want to be engaged so that they're, they feel included and welcome, and then design our engagement process around that instead of following kind of a a cookie cutter booklet, which is what we, we often do. So there's need for flexibility, even in the processes that we've designed, not just um, you know, the, the steps that follow. And then the steps that follow, the, the pilot idea, I think pilots help us do lots of different things. You know, More recently, we've seen tactical urbanism become popular because it's cheaper. It's cheaper than capital investment. But we have to remember that that was not the core idea why we, why we started doing pilots. The core idea was to actually pilot something, to see if it works, to learn from it, and then actually plug that back in to our forthcoming capital investment. Now we've gotten to a place where there's no promise of capital investment. We do pilot just for the sake of pilot because it's cheaper. So how does that plug into the longer time decision making is also really important. So that, that goal, what is the goal of the, the pilot is also very important to think about before we think about how we'll make it happen. The outcomes are really important of what we're trying to achieve. But then once we have that clear, we do need flexibility in, in, our, in our laws. We do need flexibility in um, how we allow for informal, impromptu activity to occur on our streets. Because one approach is, yes, we can have a permit process. We can make that permit process easy. We can go door to door, ask businesses to fill out that permit process, and then, you know, they can have their seating outdoors or a toy shop can put a slide outside on their some sidewalk or something. But how about that in that equity graphic that all of us have seen, how about we take that barrier of the permit away? How about we let people have a little bit more control and autonomy and agency over 
their front yard so that they could serve their communities better, what would that look like? How would they feel empowered if we allowed for that to happen? Would be a whole other level of sort of pilot that I can't even imagine. Like what if we took that barrier away of applying for a permit for every little thing that we had to do? Um, but that would be inherently flexible. If we make it to intuition and independent effort to serve a community, that would inherently be more flexible than a permit allowing for five things. And then we realize we needed a sixth and a seventh. So we rewrite the permit process. That's more time. Then we reteach the community how to apply for that permit. That's more time. Um, so we need to think about that flexibility on every turn. And we can do that if we just go ask that business owner in a immigrant community. Again, I always have my priority kind of targets. Like, how about we go to that business owner in a particular community and ask them, how would you like to do a pilot on your street? What would be the mechanisms by which you'll feel empowered? How can we make it happen for you? And then write a process around that. That's great. Um, flexibility, of course, is, is key, a key element in what you were talking about. How do we um, create spaces that are flexible enough to allow for these things to happen? Um, one of the things that we know is, is missing from our environment is, is that sense of spontaneity, that sense of unexpected encounters, uh, pick, pick, up, pick up game, uh, what, whatever all those things all those scenes that we see of uh, that are moving images of a vibrant community seem to be missing from our reality. Um, and, and so I see that re removing one way to, to uh, allow for that to happen is to remove those barriers. But um, what, what have we learned as we've come through this experience of, of this extended period of time where we've had to uh, engage in, in space differently. Some of us have chosen to retreat. Some of us have chosen to go out into the street and recapture the street and use it in different ways. How, how can some of these lessons that we've learned through our experience be applied to help make our streets more, more flexible and more useful to the communities that they are meant to serve? Right. Um, so I think I've done several things. This incredibly heartbreaking year and a half has done several things for us. Um, first, it has kind of laid bare the problems in the way our communities and our cities were designed. We know which neighborhoods, which communities were hurt the most. And we also realize that they might have been the most resource starved when it comes to quality access to food, access to education, public space and all of that, which we needed so much more of. We needed to be you know, not socializing indoors, but socializing outdoors with enough space. And we know which communities didn't have that. So they have, this time has laid bare the places where our investment should go first and foremost. So the priorities, we no longer have to fight which priority communities are. COVID and the impact and the, the areas that faced it the, the worst are our priority communities. So that data is, is in front of our eyes. The other thing that it did is it kind of showed that ways in which community needs are similar and ways in which they're different. So if the, we're all working from home and, well, not all, not our essential workers, they didn't have that privilege, some of us did. If we're working from home and we need to, we all need to shop, we need to get food. Uh, some of us have children and families, I, I, I don't, but they need to have access to childcare, they need to have access to schools. And all of those access needs are kind of the same. The shape of that, facility might look different, but the need is very similar. So we also know some of those core needs from a 24 hour day that many of our communities have. So we know what needs to be included in that 15 minute city. What do we need to build flexibility for? It's, it's shown. And the third thing that it's shown is that fast paced change is in fact possible. You know, not everything has to take 10 years. Not everything has to go through 10 different approval processes. And there's a different way of making things happen. We can think about the pilot as one more thing, a pilot can be a mechanism for engaging the community. What if we took our public meeting from a city, a room in city hall to the street? And what if it was a festival? What if that's where we engage the community? That's possible because guess what? We did that. Most of our cities had open streets during, during COVID as we were surviving it. What if we use that, continue to use that as a place for public meetings? So it has also shown us that acting fast on what we need is possible. We have all the data. We know which our community are, uh, priority communities are, and we know that it's possible to make that change happen. 
let's start to, I won't even say let's start to write better processes. I would say let's start to simplify our processes so we can continue to do that. So one of the, the biggest barriers that exists is, uh, is a topic of, you know, lots of conversation now, uh, again, because of all these things that you've just talked about, the, the things that have been exposed through our experience this past year, but zoning, you know, our, our need and desire for control and, and the way zoning and land use policies has evolved, uh, very, you know, we have a much better understanding now that they were very intentional in, in, uh, in their goals. Um, but, you know, that's what we're currently dealing with now is, uh, now that the city of Rochester has adopted a, a comprehensive plan, they're now looking at uh, the zoning alignment project, which is a way to take the zoning, uh, 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 put the microscope on the zoning and looking at how those policies need to change uh, in order to facilitate the kind of um, things that, and create the environments that we all envision. How, you know, what, what is the role of zoning and how can it be, how can it change to be more an agent to facilitate creating these environments that so many of us desire? I'm probably going to say something very controversial and I'm outside the country so I can, I can risk it. Um, I think zoning has done more harm than good. Um, it has solidified these, these silos and these, you know, separations in our daily life, which is problematic because now we've adapted our behavior to that. We expect to go somewhere else to shop. We expect to go somewhere else to go to school and so forth. But intuitively, that's not how the human being wants to live. That's not how, like we don't think about our day being split into seven different silos where we are like making all these connections from home. And it, that's not how the human body and human experience works. So now that we've created that, it's created a barrier. and. In my head, instead of thinking how do we do zoning better, I have the mindset of how do we take zoning away? Like this just this is not how we design our cities. How do we take a much more kind of human-centered approach to thinking about 15-minute cities? And that 15-minute cities is a much better framework. So if we actually thought about, you know, a, a neighborhood level plan or a 15-minute um, community, how do we design those is probably a better matrix than thinking about how do we rezone a neighborhood and, and make it better because. By rezoning it, we're putting a new set of rules, but those rules are still rules that would inhibit our community tomorrow because cities change, cities evolve, and our zoning doesn't evolve quite as fast. It becomes another kind of stencil that we have to kind of parse all of our life and our decisions through. So I would say some of it should, should go away and we should use a different matrix of either livable neighborhoods, 15 minute city, there's Barcelona super blocks, um, there are all these models to do it in a much more kind of activity and liveliness centered way instead of how do we separate our things because the impact of that is also disproportionate. We, we talked a little bit about trip chaining and how women actually tend to do a lot more trip chaining where, um, you know, women for better or for worse still bear a lot of caregiving responsibilities in their household. So they're doing a lot of smaller trips of like, dropping kids to school and picking up the laundry or picking up the grocery and like doing seven different things and not simple home to work, work to home kind of trip. So if all of these activities are now separated into silos, we're having to make seven different trips instead of making one trip. And if time is again, in fact, money, the community, the community of women is owed money for having to do seven different trips instead of one trip. Um, so it's just not how intuitively our life works. And zoning to rezoning is probably not the solution that I would recommend. I would say, throw out that metric. Let's think about a different way. Yeah. So you, you speak uh, a lot about urban villages, uh, the 15-minute village. Uh, the, uh, from one of your other presentations, I got this, this comment that is... Uh, I, a big village is made up of little villages and how density facilitates our ability to shrink our footprint, just as you very clearly demonstrated in your presentation. Um, but there's also this talk about need for regional planning. So there are these two things that are both, uh, I believe, very, very important and, and, and probably need to happen together. Um, mm -hmm. This need for our focus on the local community and building up the resources within this small area, but also how those communities uh, relate to each other and how they share resources and, and how does the planning of the overall region contribute 
to the strengths of, of these individual villages. So can you, can you speak a little bit about, about that? Yes, absolutely. I think the, the various levels is absolutely important for equitable resource allocation. If we weren't looking at the entire region, how would we know which communities potentially need more investment because they haven't historically been invested in and how do we get them the resources that are necessary? So that level of thinking, that level of vision is very important to, re to allocate our resources much better, but to also think about this other um, kind of bottom line that we sometimes don't think about, you know, the environmental bottom line of developing a built environment. Where is the right place to build? Which location will probably give be more regenerative for our, our planet than the others? And that kind of decision making can also be done at a regional level. We can't necessarily, at the scale of a neighborhood, really change too much about the environmental bottom line. So if that is our priority, in addition to the financial and the social bottom lines, I should say that. So those are the three. The triple bottom line is financial bottom line, social bottom line, and environmental. So to do the environmental bottom line, we really need to look at a regional level and think about opportunities for better development versus where there might be more harm to, to the environment. And those decisions also occur at a regional level. So we can't, we can't ignore that scale of decision making. And it's incredibly important so we can allocate our resources more equitably, financial resources, land resources, and, and others. But then, you know, the, the neighborhood level is really where we're living our life. That is our day to day. You know, even though there's a regional plan, many of us are not crossing city boundaries to, to live our daily life. So the daily experiences is really facilitated at the very local scale. So these almost have to occur parallelly. So we're allowing communities, giving them the resources that they need to re-envision their neighborhood. There was a great question here uh, from Bonnie Crossley who asks, how do we consider the needs of older citizens and their decreased mobility within the community of resources within 15 minutes and accessing those resources? So one of the things the Community Design Center uh, tries to speak to is, is always this equity issue of how that human-centered design can allow for more people to participate more easily in their mm -hmm. communities. And uh, when we had Gil Penalosa here as our speaker uh, a few years ago, you know, his opening statement was, every trip starts and ends with, uh, on your feet, typically, or, or with some kind of self-powered mobility. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about how the how we can create these environments that can be more accessible and more equitable? Right. Um, I would say that for a 15 minute city, it's important for us to really think about the most vulnerable populations in a community. We can't serve all populations, but we can serve. We can serve too. So Gil Panelos's approach of like the 880, I think is incredibly powerful. And more and more people are actually talking about the eight in the 880 is not quite eight years, it should be eight months. So thinking about a, a young caregiver pushing a stroller and a potentially older adult in a wheelchair, the kind of infrastructure that would make their life a little bit easier, both of theirs might actually look the same. And it makes it no less accessible for all the rest of us who can who have the ability to stand our own feet and power our own mobility. So two populations, we can definitely absolutely prioritize. Everyone in the middle, maybe not possible. So actually sifting it with layers of vulnerability. The other thing that kind of ties these two populations together almost is the idea of, you know, do we have to own an automobile to participate in city life? Is that our ticket to live in a city? And if that is in fact the ticket, there are two types of populations that don't get access to that ticket. People who, who can no longer drive and people who can't drive. And what if they were our priority? So we would be focusing much more on sidewalks that are wider. We would be focusing so much more on bus stops that provide easy access for strollers and wheelchairs. Curb cuts that align actually with the crosswalks and don't throw you in the middle of traffic. So we will be able to design our other systems of movement around our priority audiences. And those two are primed to be aligned and everybody else in between would be just fine if we created our, if we scaled our environment for that. We have a, a question, an interesting question that says, um, 
How do we transform the built environment when politicians, corporations, and much of the general public are aligned against the desire to transform our streets? So that's something we talk about a lot in Rochester. We are a car-centric city, like many, many, many other cities. And you and I both have the experience of uh, having traveled and lived in other cities. I lived in Venice, Italy, where you don't have cars at all. But you know, there's an interesting thing that happens when you don't have cars and, and not having cars really facilitates that social engagement, that intimate interaction that is not possible when every person drives in their own uh, car. So, uh, so this question, how do we transform the built environment when so many people find it just fine and, and serves our needs and is convenient uh, as um, is? I would say, all of us should think about elevating the voices of people who have been disadvantaged through this kind of built environment. You know, I, it's, it's a lot of work. It's an emotional drain for me to continue to tell my sort of I don't drive story and how, you know, what it did to my daily life. But the reality is I could have very easily learned to drive. I could have very easily driven. So my voice is probably not the most prominent one to be elevated every time. But how about those older adults who've had to give up their, their cars and their licenses and can, can no longer have access to healthy food, can no longer have access to a medical facility. Again, we're in the middle of a pandemic. So we have to think about how do we elevate the voices of those who have not been served by this built environment. But in terms of politicians, how do we elevate some of these people who may have been marginalized through the system, elevate them to the office, like actually reshift our power and give more and more power to people who may not always have been the ones holding that power. So like I said, I'll go back to what's top of mind today is the new Boston mayor. How do we start to change that idea of who a politician is, whose voice deserves to be heard, and who can we actually put at a pedestal so they start to think differently? And I, and I will say, so far, some of the, the newer mayors who happen to be women are taking some risks with mobility, are, are changing the environment. I mean, fan of Mayor Hidalgo here in Paris and, and you know, Mayor of Barcelona. And it's just, we're, we're getting somewhere. I think we need to plug some gaps in um, visibility and access and power. And if we start to rebalance that, we might start to see things differently. But we all just have to slowly learn the economic argument around, you know, sustainable mobility. We have to get much better at understanding the cost of a car culture on our planet, the, the cost of road-based freight on our planet and it will not be the individual human at the end of the day who you know the person who has to drive themselves and take care of their children it won't be them who change their behaviors the people who hold more power and responsibility should be the ones changing the environment for the people we can't expect everybody to just give up their cars their environment is not fit to do anything else right so that's that's it and have more responsibility but that's something we often talk about the fact that um we can't help being a car-centric city when there really aren't other viable options. So we do have a patchwork of dedicated bike lanes, but if you look at that map, uh, there are little segments of streets that uh, you know appear and disappear. And so somehow you drop out of the sky onto a portion of bike lane and then some little hook picks you up and transports you over to the next section of, 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 of bike lane. And so we've always talked about, you know, if it's not a complete system, then it's not useful. And if it's not, a, it's, if it's not networked, if it's not connected to other systems where you're talking about the chaining capability of being able to transition from one mode of transportation to the other, then again, you're, you're missing uh, the opportunity to create options that, are, uh, that, that can be truly used. Oftentimes when we're making decisions, we, we use uh, use as, as, a, uh, as a metric. And so we say, oh, well, you know, we have all these bike lanes, but nobody uses them. So what's the point? But, you know, it's not a useful system. And so how do we really uh, help people understand the need that in order for something to really become an asset to the community, it needs to be uh, a complete system? Um, um, yeah, I, I think I have like kind of a three word approach to that for any system to be successful, for any behavior to change, we need it to be efficient, convenient and safe. If it's not convenient, if it's not right at your doorstep, you're not going to put in the extra effort because why should you? Because another choice is more convenient. So it needs to be convenient. It needs to be efficient. It needs to get you from point A to point B. 
without having to spend too much money, too much time or losing too much time. The way we thought about our highway system from like going from home to work, that level of efficiency. And it needs to be safe because most of our infrastructure, like the design of our cars is literally killing more women because their bodies and their unique anatomy is not accounted for. How do we, how do we expect that to change unless we make it safe, unless we change the, the system of the, the safety in, in a car, we can't expect people to change behavior. So it has to be safe, efficient, convenient, or it won't work. We never expect people to just, you know, drive on roads that, that end and become dirt. We don't expect that. How can we expect people to ride cycles that then throw them into an arterial without a way to, to be safe? Well, I, I enjoyed speaking with you so much and I noticed that we've gone a little bit beyond our time and certainly I would expect that uh, we would love the opportunity to have you back uh, at some point in the future. Um, one, one last point I wanted to make when you mentioned, uh, you know, the, the way our spaces are created and the way cars are built. We had a, a good friend of yours as our uh, speaker for the luncheon several years ago, uh, Katrina Justin Zimmerman, who really opened my eyes to this concept of, you know, we do live in a literally man-made environment and the importance to, um, the importance of how, you know, seeing how these spaces and how these products are created, you know, through whose perspective, who's, who's making the decisions regarding these things uh, is critically important. So, um, and then the other thing we've, that's come up time and time again is this whole notion of our, how we act as, as uh, individuals and community, the need to act uh, out of kindness and compassion, and how do we create spaces that will facilitate that kind of uh, experience. Uh, and every year we've had a speaker who has um, talked to this issue. So we really think that helping to create spaces, again, centered on human uh, scale and human experiences is a great model. Uh, hopefully we'll have, uh, we'll see continued success in that area. But for now, I have to thank you so much for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. I wish you luck uh, in your studies. Uh, and uh, certainly, would love, love to continue this conversation uh, sometime down the road. I'm sure this is going to be a topic of interest for many years to come. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do it. Do it. Folks, to all of you that we didn't get to your questions, there are a lot of comments. We will share the presentation with you and we will share um, the, the questions. Uh, and certainly, please, I invite you to participate in our following uh, follow-up community conversation. Next week, we have the pleasure of having Bob Williams, who is the Program Manager of Active Transportation at Genesee Transportation Council, and Pete Nabosny, the Vice President of Reconnect Rochester, who will join us in, uh, in helping to facilitate what I'm sure will be a wonderful con conversation based on the information that was provided today and for all of your interests and questions that we did not get to. So please join us next week. Uh, we need you to register, but it is free and I uh, look forward to you all. And after that, we want to let you know that our next lecture uh, presentation is April 28th featuring Mitchell Silver, who is the Commissioner of New York City Parks in New York. Uh, we look forward to having a wonderful conversation about public spaces. So please register for that and we look forward to seeing you then. And lastly, I want to remind you to please fill out our survey so that uh, we can have, uh, we can take your feedback into consideration as we consider topics of interest for any of our programs, including potential future speakers, uh, Placemaking 101, and other events that we might be able to organize as we transition through this, uh, this time of emerging from our uh, virtual meetings to the opportunity to hopefully have some small in-person uh, opportunities for engagement. Um, you know, we'd love to hear your thoughts on how you feel about that and what kinds of topics and people you might want to uh, focus on. So with all of that, I thank all of you for hanging in there. I appreciate your patience and we look forward to seeing you again. Bye-bye everyone. <laughs>